Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to How to Organize a Successful Crowdfunding Campaign. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a Director of Programs at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that's building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. As you may have just seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, along with our partner Mentor Cloud, launched a free mentor matching platform called Mentor Makers. You can create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So find or become a mentor today by using that link in the chat. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Quick housekeeping, we're gonna open up for live Q&A near the end of the event, so please submit those questions for us in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout our presentation. Try to get to them all. Now, none of what we do here at the center could be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, and HubSpot. We're grateful and humbled by their contributions. Now, during these still, in so many ways, unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. So before we get started, I'm going to just launch a quick poll to just let us know how you're feeling about your business right now. Can't believe how fast 2022 has flown by. We use this to understand the wellness for entrepreneurs that we should be providing amongst all the many other things that we provide. So thank you for letting us know how you're doing today. Hopefully well. All right, I'm going to end this poll. Share those results. Looks like optimism is in the lead, but there is a little bit of survival mode and anxiety out there. So hopefully our presentation today will be able to help with some of that sentiment. So without any further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our very special guest today, Don Dixon, founder and CEO of Popcom. Hi, Don. Hey, Colin. Thanks for having me today. Great to see oh. everybody in here. Can you hear me? Yep. Got you now. Good. Perfect. Great. Love well, um, yeah. And I'm feeling a little anxious and optimistic too, you guys. You know, so we're always, it's, it's, that's entrepreneur life. It's day to day. Hey, we're in this together. Um, well, Don, yeah, I'm just going to jump right into our topic for the, um, for our discussion today, but to start us off, your entrepreneurial journey has been pretty unique and, uh, most entrepreneurs journeys are unique. Can you share a little bit about what led you to entrepreneurship in the first place and how you got to where you got to today? That's a long one, Colin. So I'm gonna keep it real short as possible. I've been entrepreneur full-time now, 21 years, and I will say, I um just it felt like I was led to it. I, I wanted to do my own thing. I went to school for tech, so I learned how to code and I learned just everything about um computer information technology in when I was like 21. And it was the early days of of you know the the World Wide Web as something that we use for the tools that we use it for today. And when I got my first corporate job using those tech skills, I just realized that I could be using my new skills that a lot of people don't have to actually go into business and create a business and solve problems out here in the world that needed to be solved that I could innovate. And so I just felt strong that my skills were better served as an entrepreneur than working in a corporate role. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean... <laughs> Create your own destiny, right? Yes. And that, that first business was 2001. And then I've started six, seven businesses since then. Um, five are still in business today. And I'm the CEO currently of Popcom. So focusing on building software, but also a shoe business, a yoga studio, an RV business, a, a speaking and coaching business. So I really consider myself a serial entrepreneur because like, I just identify problems that I experience. And then when I realize other people have these problems and they're willing to pay for a solution, I get excited. And I, I like to build businesses for products that people actually need. Love it. And we're here to talk about Popcom today um, and how you crowdfunded. So for those of you who, who don't know who are on the call, um, I know crowdfunding is a pretty pop or common term, but can you explain just at a high level how crowdfunding works? 
Yes. So there's various types of crowdfunding, but the kind we're talking about today is equity crowdfunding. So all of us have heard about like Kickstarter and um, uh, Indiegogo. Those are those are more of project based crowdfunding where people pre-purchase a product or a project they want to support. That's very different than equity crowdfunding when you're actually selling shares in your company to investors. And so equity crowdfunding really just became a thing, I would say, after the law passed in 2012 called the Jobs Act by the Obama administration. And it took a few years to about 2016 for it actually to get into play where we could actually raise money. But this is the first time in the history of our country since, uh, let's see, 1920 after the Great Depression and the stock market crash where non-accredited investors can invest in privately held companies. And non-accredited means anyone that is making under $200,000 a year as an individual or under less than $300,000 a year as a married couple or less than a million dollars net worth. There are also some clauses around being a director or officer, typically a CEO of a company that'll allow you to have accreditation status. But typically most of us, 90% of Americans were not accredited. We do not fall in that status, which means only 10% of Americans can traditionally get into private equity deals and opportunities that can then result in a large liquidity event that can then result in generational wealth. So for example, prior to the Jobs Act, you couldn't invest in a company like a Uber um, unless you were already making a million dollars, you know, already a million dollars net worth and already had the accreditation status. So if you ever notice on, on Uber when it went public, there was a, a couple investors invested like $5,000 in Uber and they ended up exiting for millions of dollars. The only way that you can get to a table to be able to say, I have 5,000 to put it on this cool business is if you're already rich. So that led me to say, well, how can the rest of us get rich if you gotta be rich to get richer? And so that is really what crowdfunding is. It gives us all an opportunity to invest in privately held early stage companies of all types, not just tech. Love it. Make the table bigger, huh? Yeah. Um, so what are some of the pros and cons of crowdfunding? I mean, there's, you know, I will say fun, fundraising is hard no matter what. Um, it doesn't it, it doesn't make it easier because you crowdfund. It's just a matter of picking a strategy that aligns best with where your company is at at the time. And so there are certain things that just make it easier. And so, you know, some of the pros are obviously if you if you have a, a strong network and this is just first just going off of who you are as as the founder and your and your company. If you have a strong network, people that people that know you, followers, customers, which customers are always the best people to convert to investors because they actually are buying and believing your product. So if you have a customer base, they're the, the great people to go to first. So customers, your network, your social media following, people that believe in you, um, your warm market, I would like to call it. If that's strong, then you can raise money and it's pretty easy. But a con is if you don't have that market, if you don't have that network, which everyone does not, you do have to invest time, resources, and money to building that network, typically doing things like advertising, definitely positioning yourself to be a thought leader, definitely getting yourself out there as many podcasts and as many, just anything you can do to get out there to build your audience, because it all does come down to community. And it really is like math, you know, it's, it's an equation, you get a certain percentage of eyes on your campaign, and then you're going to convert some. So let's say if the conversion rate, which it is standard for me, I'd say my typical conversion rates like 25%, then you know, you need to get like 10,000 people on the page to get a certain amount, you kind of can calculate like you need to get, you're going to convert maybe 10 to 20% of everybody that comes to your page. So you got to get mass people to your page. So marketing is a is a lot of the process. And in a traditional a fundraising campaign, like going traditional route as in venture capital, you're not doing extensive marketing campaigns. That's not what you're doing. So it's very, very different, but also very time consuming because you're also not having a ton of one-on-one -on -one pitches. So you have to really put yourself out there. So a pro and a con, depending on your personality is you're always have to be out there. You put yourself at risk of all kinds of comments, good and bad, all kinds of questions, good and bad, but you have to be comfortable uh, really being held accountable to be comfortable with all of your business out for the public to see good and bad. Everything is on, on display and everything's kind of, you know, with a fine tooth comb. But if you're okay with that, which, you know, I always have been, 
it's a pro because you have nothing to hide, you know, but it can be a con if you, if you don't have everything together and everything ready. And if you're also uncomfortable interacting or speaking publicly, it could, it could be um, a con. Another a pro, you know, a pro is it's faster, um, can be faster, but a con is it can be slower. Um, you know, I've had rounds open in two or three weeks in my recent round. It took me three, four months almost to, um, to open my recent round. And my very first round took me seven months. So it just, there's a lot of due diligence involved. And so again, a pro is if your due diligence data room is, is on point and ready, you're doing your filings right, your, your financials are up to date, your financials are in gap format, your financials are, um, you know, they're in your data room, all of your employment agreements and your business is really ran like a corporation, you'll be good. A con is most early stage scrappy startups are not running themselves like a corporation and they don't have all these things. And so you have to kind of scramble to make sure you have those things to be able to raise money. But then on the flip side, it ends up being a to your benefit because now you have everything you need documentation wise and you can actually grow and it positions your, you to be able to be acquired. So the great thing about like being uncomfortable in the due diligence process is once you do it, you, it actually makes it easier to secure venture capital because you have a very good data room, due diligence is on point. And it also makes it easier for you to later be acquired because you're now tracking and treating your company like a corporation. And then it'll teach you to get in the habit of filing all your documents all the time as you grow your business. So those are the top ones, just the time it takes. And then just, you know, the requirements um, are very, there's no difference as far as requirements to raise money from VC and crowdfunding, I would say crowdfunding has more rigorous um, regulation and more rigorous due diligence than even venture capital sometimes. And I've raised $1.3 million from VC and angels before I decided to just stay on the other side and do crowdfunding. Love that. And pardon me, I'm clearing my throat. Um, well, you mentioned something that I wanted to dial into a little bit more, which is um, for those of the entrepreneurs out in our network that don't have large networks of people, what are some of the things that need they need to think about expanding that network before even going live with the campaign? Yes. And that's important. And I tell people, if you know you want to crowdfund, it usually comes out of like, you know, urgent cash need, but hopefully you're here today because you want to plan ahead and you want to learn. And if you know you want to crowdfund, start planning three to six months ahead of time with your marketing and with positioning you and your company, making sure that when people Google you, there's things out there that they can read about you and your company. That means strengthening your LinkedIn profile, strengthening your social media profile, especially on Twitter and LinkedIn. That's where investors are. And you want to make sure that you're talking about your industry, talking about your, the, your accolades, talking about what you do, positioning yourself to be a thought leader. Also, you guys know there's like so many blogs, so many podcasts, so many websites, get on everything you can. Every media matters. Even me today, I've been in Forbes, I've been an entrepreneur, I've been in Inc. But if someone has a blog with a hundred readers, I'm taking it. That's a hundred more people that I have never talked to. So it's like every opportunity you get to touch of the community, you touch the community. And so many people are looking for content and you could provide content about your industry, about your business, about your journey. That content then translates to being placed online. And then when you launch your campaign, there's more information about you and you're starting to build like a community of people that just align with you. It's better to do that before coming out of nowhere and saying, hey, give me some money. It just never works like that. Also, it's very important to cultivate the relationship you have with your current community and ask them to bring other people into that community. So for example, what I done, have done for years is do a um, monthly, bi-monthly, it could be around that range, but an update about what I'm working on. And it's to my own community. I call it like I have MailChimp and I have all these lists on MailChimp, but one's called Dawn's List. And it's like people I might meet at a conference or like people I met when I was in NASDAQ program. And I may not be able to do business with them today, but I want to stay in touch with them. I want them to know what I'm doing. I want them to hear from me, but I can't reach out to like 500 people all the time every month. So every month I send an email to about 560 people that I've met at conferences, events, and just things over the past you know, decade, and I update them on what, I, on what I'm doing. But it's more than that, because there's a way you have to engage people so they just don't click off of it. So I have a, a, a structure where I'll, in every email, I'll put top thing I'm excited about, challenges that I'm facing, and then I'll ask a question, advice, but I'll get something that'll make them engage with me and interact. So I'll be like, hey, anybody have a good, a good referral for an accountant? Or 
give me feedback on these two different ad collaterals. Which one do you think looks better? Just getting them to like engage, not asking them for anything. Everybody loves to give their advice. Everybody loves to give their opinion. Ask them for it. Then after giving their advice and opinion so much, they're a lot more comfortable giving you money. And that is that is really the formula. Yeah, what a hustle. And I mean, I love getting your updates. So uh, just keeping top of mind um, and having a being a familiar face again before you start asking people for money. Great idea. Yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit of tactical stuff. So you uh, mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, preparing your network, getting on blogs, doing interviews, doing webinars. Um, but you mentioned data room gap accounting. So, so what are some of like the steps that one needs to check the box on before even like launching the campaign? Um, definitely everyone can Google due diligence checklists. There are many, many, many out there. Download it. Make sure every business you start, like anything that I have, I get a Google Drive, a Google, a box, Dropbox, whatever you like, whatever file sharing service that you like. Create folders and just start putting everything in those folders from day one. Every month, I reconcile my due diligence data room. Every month, I add the financials to it. Every month, I add, if, if I hire somebody, I add it. If someone is no longer with the company, I add it. Sign a new contract, I add it. Everything that happens in the business, I add those things. And that's the things that investors always want to see. If you stay ready, an ongoing be ready, you never have to get ready at the last minute. So Google due diligence uh, checklist and make your data room. Data room only means central repository for information. So when they say, let me see your data room, send them <laughs> the link to your documents. It's funny because like the VC jargon and the investor jargon, it, it, it can trip you up because, you know, they're like, is this supposed to be this special room that I send them? Yeah. <laughs> Literally just like a link to some folders. And I remember when they first asked me, I'm like, what the heck am I supposed to be having here? Is this some complex software that I need? No, just have your documents, you know, your LLC or your C corporation or your board, all of your board materials and your employment agreements and every piece of paper that you sign, um, you need to put it in a folder and it's no longer a file cabinet. You know, I'm old school. They had file cabinets aligned along the walls and companies back in the day. Now we're blessed to have these um, clouds to host things for us. I love that. Um, yeah, and I remember first hearing the term, I'm like, is this a physical room? Yeah, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yep. Um, okay, so you get all your things together. You, you, um, you're you warming your community up, if you will. Now yeah. you've launched. So what was your strategy to get in front of as many people as possible, convert as many people as possible once it's actually live? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. Some of the platforms allow you to run test the waters campaigns where you can just kind of before you go all in and invest into the full due diligence and invest into financial reviews, which require to invest money into bad actor checks, invest money into other things that are required to pay up front. You can just launch a simple test the waters and see like, hey, will you even invest in this? So I did that for my round recently um, in June. Launched a test of waters campaign just to see if my investors weren't tired of me. And it just says, hey, would you commit to invest in this? Are you interested? Will you reserve shares? We're not soliciting, we're not soliciting money right now. But like if we did crowdfund, hypothetically, can you can we count you in and can you reserve some shares? And that's a great way to test the waters and see like, can you really get people to move? And if they don't, then you don't have to launch it yet. You can spend some more time. And if they do, then boom. Let's go because 21 days after launch, you can take a deposit, you can take a withdrawal. So if you need money right now, you can get money within 30 days of launching if you have a strong momentum out the gate. So that's what you do in the beginning. But then after you launch, it's just definitely important to do constant updates on your campaign page. Of course, sending it out, sending the campaign out to your, your market and saying, hey, guys, you told me you were, you know, if you did test the waters, okay, guys, you, you revert, you committed to reserve some, I need you to invest in the first 48 hours. What happens in the first 48 hours to seven days really determines the success and the momentum of your campaign because you really want to get that FOMO effect and you want to get people like, that's just how our, our culture works. People have to get excited. They want to see other people wanting to do it. So the way to get strangers who don't know you or your business to invest in you and get excited is to get the people that actually do know you to invest in you and get excited. So if you can't get your community to come behind you early, it's really difficult to get outside communities to come behind you early. So that's why I did my test of waters is even see if I could, if I was able to do that again. And luckily, we were able to get 130,000 in reservations. And I said, okay, well, at least people are still interested and check the temperature. I'm going to move forward. And then it took two more months after that to actually launch the campaign. And that's only because things just kept, 
getting tripped up in due diligence. And even though I feel like I'm really good at my due diligence, it ended up coming down to a few numbers and calculations on the cap table that just we couldn't figure out. And it, it just, it took a while to really go through everything. So things can happen. But like I said, like you said, Colin, after you launch it, constant communication, um, town halls, IG live, Facebook live, YouTube live, updates on the campaign page, really showing them um, what, you know, what your plans are, that people are very, very visual. And so you need to put information out there in every way people receive it. So pe some people read, some people like to watch videos and some people like short clips, no longer than 10 to 15 seconds due to their attention span. Me, I say, give them, give them information in every way you can. I'll write a whole case study and we'll write articles and blogs. I'll shoot videos about, you know, do whole demos. I'll do short clips. And I just really try to meet the people, you know, where they are. I love that. Yeah. So when it starts, it's the continuing the hustle. It's not just, it, oh, it's it, launched. No, no <laughs> yep. not, you can't walk away. It's it's really a lot of work. And you have to make sure to check the questions every day on the page, answer the questions people have, engage with people, be available, be prepared for people finding you personally on your personal social media and being in your personal social media, Instagrams, Facebook, DM and message box. Just don't be frustrated by it. It can be frustrating, but don't be because you, again, you want to meet them where they are. And so it's just like, it's it's so much time that it's required and very time consuming, but I still, I still liked it better for me personally, after now raising up 6 million in crowdfunding and 1.23 in venture. And I still like crowdfunding better. Mm. And I mean, I still got to pat you on the back a million times over because you still have to run your company during this time, right? It's a full-time job to fundraise in it's addition to just running your business. Yes, it's very challenging. And this is my first crowdfunding campaign that I'm actually in now that I've had to kind of manage it myself. In the past, I had two, tem two team members working the campaigns with me. We had like in-house marketing team and <clears throat> we don't now, you know, we've, we've definitely been impacted by the market and we've changed and reduced our burn. And we also wanted to shift our team from like a builder team to a scalar team. So this is my first time doing it on my own, but I set up a system and it's been really helpful. So it is, it is possible. So now I can actually say um, it is possible to run a campaign by yourself but you have to put systems and automations in place and really, really plan your content strategy and use tools like, so, and my system using tools, like um, whatever automation you use for social media, I don't like to like shout them out, but like Buffer is one of them that we've used, but there's others that I know are, are really good as far as um, scheduling content. So just making sure that like, you're always scheduling content. Something's always coming out. There's always an update every day, invest, invest. And then what I did, um, I treated my very first crowdfunding campaign. I treated it like a album release because I came from like the marketing side and like entertainment and events. Mm -hmm. And so, and yes, this can apply to nonprofits as well. This fundraising, fundraising is fundraising at the end of the day, as far as how you build your community, it can be translated across many industries. This is about really community building because if you can build your community where they trust you and you have that influence they will take action a lot of people have a lot of followers and things but they can't get them to convert and take action it's not about the quantity of your community it's about the quality and how they will then be your ambassadors and your evangelists and i'm where i am today because my investors actually became evangelists and they really started to help promote it because i kept them updated i made them included i would do and i still do um quarterly investor town halls where I just sit and just get on zoom and talk and whatever they want. I give them an update and we talk and I answer questions, um, all the time. And, you know, we, we do the investor, we have a private investor Facebook group that I go on there and post updates. They can talk and engage with each other. I send monthly investor updates to them. Even before I closed the round, I was still putting regular updates on the page, letting them know what we're doing, just like constantly, being being visible and someone said other oh, still albums i mean i told you guys i'm old school so album releases when they would count down you know to like dropping in 10 days dropping <laughs> so what i did was create graphics so every time we hit a milestone i would put like a 10,000 raise 15,000 so it became like an exciting thing because my first round people watched us go from zero to a million and you know it would be 500,000 520,000 500 you know and it's got exciting and people kept seeing it in that it's like a dopamine thing. You know, once you tap into like what people need to see to trigger action from them, 
that one that, that that viral effect you know that's what you want to try to tap into and i really did that by just constantly putting it out there like how they promote you know music industry projects i love that um so you mentioned some things in the internet is the internet but um you mentioned some things about you know there's going to be some haters out there uh which you know is again just an internet thing oh god uh, but no, did you hit no. any roadblocks when crowdfunding um and sort of how did you handle them I mean, the roadblocks are always from like the time that it takes. I'm ready now. We're all ready now. All the founders we want are we want to raise money right now. And so just going through the due, due diligence process, going through. So between now, um, I started doing crowdfunding 2019, the first campaign launch, but I started working on it 2018. And now 2020, it's very much changed. The laws have changed. Now you can raise five million under a reg CF and 50 million under a reg, a reg A plus. And also the SEC regulations and requirements have changed and they're much more strenuous because several of the platforms have been fined by the SEC for things happening like them letting founders make claims that may or may not have been true or exaggerating. And so get to really protect these investors. And it is the platform's job to protect the investors. Of course, um, investing is never guaranteed in anything, but there are bad actors and so it's their job. So now it's a little bit harder to do it really fast. So a lot of time my frustration will lie in just, you know, the, the process of compliance. I mean, they will make me go back everything on the page and I'm not exaggerating. I have to provide a source. Everything I say, you can't just say 20% of the industry. No, show me where in multiple sources where this is true. If I say we have 500 customers on the wait list. Okay, show me the wait list. So they, one thing I'll tell you all in confidence is if you're raised, if you're investing in crowdfunding companies, the information you read has been verified. They're not, we're not allowed to just make up stuff and just say whatever we want to say about our company, which is different than a real founder in the real world with an investor, because as we all know, investor founders lie all day about numbers and they don't have to get them verified. But in crowdfunding, because you're dealing with non-accredited investors, there's a responsibility to to fact check everything. Love that. And you mentioned platforms. Um, so there's so many avenues out there that you could crowdfund on. Um, which one do you prefer? Why? Um, I mean, I'm I'm biased to Start Engine. I've done five. Now this is I'm on my fifth crowdfunding campaign with them. I this is my fourth for for Popcom, and I did one for my business, Flat Out of Heels. So I did I did in transparency go and do a, a test of waters on another campaign, and I just really. It made me remember like the value of relationships, you know, like even though Start Engine is not my investor per se, we're in a we're in a long term relationship and we've been partners and both of us are startups and we kind of grew and growing together. And um, that's why I went back to them, because I do value relationships and they definitely have done a lot of things to help my company. And I believe in like founder first um, type of investors and partners. And the way that Start Engine empowered me to set my own valuation, they empowered me and put me on stages and platforms and gave me opportunities. That means a lot to me. So I, I definitely think that when you are vetting your, your crowdfunding platform of choice, make sure they're going to be advocating for you. Ask questions like, you know, when, at what point do you send an email about our campaign to your community? Because again, you're on the platform because you want to leverage their community and they have access to every single person that ever invested in any company ever on their platform. They keep all those email addresses. And once you reach a certain threshold, they'll send it out. But sometimes they raise the bar so high, you may never get a chance to get that email sent out. They may say, oh, we don't send it out till you reach 100,000. You'll never get to do that. So it's important to ask. Also ask what opportunities exist for me to continue to promote my company through your network? You know, how can, like just really interview them before you give them your money because you're giving them your money. They're taking a percentage of your raise and really what they do is going to determine, you know, your success. So definitely vet them, interview them. I interviewed every platform that's out there. I've definitely had a call with all of them. I've interviewed them and I still continue to um, go with Start Engine, but I know people have had great experiences with other ones. And it really comes down to like, what are you looking for? I want to add something else. Um, check those documents. If you don't read those documents, do not ever sign anything legal without an attorney. I don't care what they tell you. There's so many hidden things in these documents. I found so many things across my rounds and that I had to point out that people didn't see. And I'm like, well, what is this clause? You telling me I have to give them preferred shares? 
keep an eye out for things like preemptive rights, preferred shares, and things like that built into these crowdfunding contracts. Also, keep a lookout for a lot of these platforms try to get you to give them a percentage of your equity. It's in their documents. If you let it go, they'll get a percentage. Don't give up shares in your business just arbitrarily to do that. So definitely read these things. Sometimes the, the things that I've seen in, con, uh, in contracts for crowdfunding is very similar to some of the things that I definitely don't approve of in the venture world. Because keep in mind, everybody's in business to make money and nobody's in business to protect you. You must protect yourself, especially in this space, because there's... Um, there's no investor that's going to set your terms. So you have to really pay attention to everything that the crowdfunding platform sends you, all the terms in your deal docs. Don't be so desperate to raise money that you sign something that you don't, that doesn't feel right for you because it'll always come back. Wow. It's like golden advice this whole time. Everyone's chatting it up saying, yeah, you're the best. Um, Don, so you nailed your goals uh, out of the park, I might add. Um, so once you do hit your goal, um, what's next? And also follow up to that one. What happens if you don't hit your goal? I've never experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> a little pop my own collar. But, um, you know, I think that um, what do you do next? Let me say it closes. Now, if you don't reach your goal, if it's say this is what I say. I always set my goal, even me. I set my goal to $10,000 every time because I want my money and you only can get the money if you if you raise like five or 10 times your minimum. So I had to get to like 100,000 actually or something of that nature for me to be able to get the money. So I set it low. So I would recommend setting it as low as possible so that way you can get the money. So it may be like, if you in your mind say, I really want to raise a half a million and you only end, end up raising 60 or 50, take that money. It's really, it's great. And that's amazing. Don't ever like turn down the money. All of it helps. But of course, we always want to hit that top line goal. And unfortunately, the platforms allow for you to extend your campaigns. So if you're making that momentum and you need more than a three month window that's allotted, you can just say, hey, I want to extend this campaign and keep pushing it, which I have done in the past. I've extended a campaign, the Reggae Plus, because I was raising a lot more. And that was my first time raising a round of that size. And I actually ended up closing it early because it became very exhausting and I wanted to go and try another, um, I wanted to raise money in, a, in another way. So after you close that, if you meet the goal, just meet your minimum, set your minimum low so you can at least get that cash. That's the advice. After you reach it, still constant updates. I recommend following my model or creating your own way of engagement. Maybe you like Discord. Maybe you have your own platform, but just have a place where your investors can reach you all the time. Have a place where you can post information and share with them. Never have people feeling like they're in the dark and they don't have they don't know what's going on with their money. They the people don't like that. They will call you out. So you definitely just keep in mind you're in the public. You want to have a good relationship with your investors. So you want to make them feel like they're in the loop and you still can't please everyone. But if you're doing what you're supposed to do, sending regular updates, you know, I use social media a lot. We post on our social a lot. We have like 15,000 followers on there and we post there. We post on our investor group. I send updates and then I give them their own email, shareholders email, and they can email anytime and ask any questions. And I also like crowdfunding because all of your investors information is stored in their dashboard and, and then your crowdfunding platform can manage those investors. You have a master record of all investments on your cap table. That's a given. The cap table stores everything. You should have a lawyer or a platform like a Carta or something like that managing your cap table. That's how you keep records. That's where it's at. People will say, I need a stock certificate. No, you don't. This is not 1950. You don't need a stock certificate for anything. Stock certificates are novelties at this point. You can download one, you can have it, but you don't need it because it's all digital. So just make sure that they are aware of that, but they can get their stock certificate on your platform, which I love because people don't understand how things have changed. And, you know, the platform really does help to be an investor relations partner, which is very much needed. So always following up, you know, posting on your campaign. I post on the page at least probably every three months on the general page for the non-investors just so people can see. And then I post to our investors at least once a month, but we definitely engage with them a lot. Love it. Um, so what like physically happens from like a financial standpoint once the money hits the bank? 
once it hits the bank, well, um, get to work, you know? So obviously there's a budget. They, they definitely make you submit a detailed use of funds. It's definitely important to stick to that because there is accountability in all of this. It's certainly eyes, all eyes on you. And so definitely follow the plan that you initially put out there. We all know in startup land, plans change. If a plan changes, let them know. Just tell them like, hey, we were budgeting for this. And now, you know, we're going to do this. I don't send my investors detailed financial reports because those are really very close. But we have SEC financials that are published so people can see that as well. Um, but after the money goes in the bank, you know, it's just time to get to work. It's time to really focus on getting that return and showing the investors what you did, what you did with their money. That's the main thing, letting them see you took their money and you did exactly what you said you were going to do. And that is what we did. Someone asked in the chat, what's the stage of our company? We raised our first crowdfunding 2019. And after now, 2022, we have products in the market. So our stage is in the market generating revenue. So when I first started, our stage was development, no products. Now we're product and market generating revenue. And that's thanks to all of our crowdfunding investors. And now they feel really excited because even though I can't tell them they're going to get a return yet right now, I'm so early stage. The return to them is walking through an airport or and seeing the product they invested in, or the return is just seeing that the money that they invested is actually being used to do what I said I was going to do. And that's really all they want at the end of the day is for you to be honest with them. And when things don't go right, which things don't go right all the time, all the time things don't go right. I just say like, hey guys, it didn't work out. I tried my best. It didn't work out. Then I'll do a town hall and I'll explain and they'll say, okay. And so that's, it's freeing to just, you know, be transparent with them. Yeah. Transparency is super key. Um, so you've got now a bunch of shareholders. So what's, what are some of those long-term commitments? You mentioned some of the updates um, on the platform, uh, but can you go into a little bit more detail of like, what you have to do to all these people who are now on the cap, cap table? Well, again, just the mainly the updates. I have 10,000 investors, a little over 10,000. Some of them are like real passive. Like some people invest their money and they're like, I forgot about this. You know, it happens. Some people are very much, very active and very, very engaged, which is fine. You know, probably about 2,000 of them are very engaged of the 10. So, you know, I, I interact with 2000 of them pretty regularly. And then I send the emails, I check the emails, you can see the open rate. So they're really, they're reading the emails. Um, but what it looks like for my business is one line item on the cap table. So I have raised three crowdfunding campaigns. My cap table is very clean. There's three separate line items on my cap table that's handled kind of like a syndicate. If you're familiar with a syndicate, angel investors coming together, all putting their money in. They're not a fund, but they're investing under this one line item. And that's that only takes that one space. And then when they get liquidity for that group, everybody disperses there. So for each crowdfunding round, they're handled as a group. Everybody's kind of boxed in together. So when we exit, then crowdfunding vehicle A, that's everybody from 2019. Crowdfunding vehicle B, everybody from 2020. Crowdfunding vehicle C, everybody from 2021. Now we're in the next phase. So it's very organized and I have a great you know, law firm that helps me manage it. And I also use a, a cap table management company called Shoebox, S-H-O-O -O Box. It's the only one that I found that will actually work with crowdfunding companies because Carta would not work with me. Huh. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, Carter, Carter will not do crowdfunding. So it was a challenge at first to find someone to help with that. Uh, super great advice. Um, and now having done it so many times, what did you, what were some of the missteps you took in the first round that you wish you knew now that you've already successfully done it? Um, man, I don't want to say it was like, I'm trying to think what was the first one was the best. I feel it was like the best. Yeah. It was like the breakout one. It was, it was, it was like a, it was like a fairy tale actually, um, how it happened with me going on the breakfast club and it going viral. And, you know, I was the first woman to ever raise over a million crowdfunding. It was like amazing. I wish I could do them all like that, Colin. That was the flawless one I've been trying to repeat. And so it, I think it was just like so pure. I mean, it, at the time it resonated with the people, um, it, it was a time of everybody talking about ownership, you know, Jay-Z with a 444 came out and it was just like the energy of ownership and the energy of investing and, and no one else was doing this. So everybody was like, oh my God, we can invest now. So it was just like getting really, really um, re a lot of momentum. So I want to emulate that again, if I can this time, but what I would change in the second one is spending so much money on ads. I will And then now the algor algorithms are different. 
Um, so now Facebook ads don't have as much weight as they did before because of the Apple update. But before, I mean, I probably, I definitely, without a doubt, spent six figures on advertisements for sure. Um, definitely. So to bring in, you know, let's say to bring in a million, you're going to put in typically a hundred thousand and that's coming out of your operating. So it's just like one, that's another thing about, about crowdfunding. And recently I tweeted, um, I raised over 6 million, about 6 million. And I only had about 4.8 million actually hit the bank. And the rest of that is fees and ads and accounting fees and 20,000 here and auditors and 30,000 here. And so, you know, it, it definitely really, really adds up. All of this is such great advice. We have a ton of questions. Um, Don, what's like a key takeaway? Oh, just over 20 questions. In there. Yeah, no, we got a bunch. Um, and my dog's trying to eat <laughs> okay, a tap. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's, 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 uh, let's. So what's one key takeaway that you want everyone to take away with today? The key takeaway is that crowdfunding is not for everyone and neither is any type of funding. Just do your research and read my blog um, on Dawn, dawndixon.me and take you to my medium. And it's really like a checklist kind of things you need to prepare for. Don't start yeah. before you're ready. Um, definitely, definitely the advice is have a plan, have a plan and have your due diligence ready. That's, that's the advice. Have your due diligence ready and you can pretty much go raise money wh where you need to. Love it. All right, we're going to jump into Q&A, but before we do, I'm going to launch a quick poll that just helps us understand what you would like to learn, our community of entrepreneurs, in the coming months. So appreciate all of you uh, voting on this poll, and uh, just let us know, and we're going to jump into q and in just a moment. If you haven't dropped your question into Q&A, do so now. All yeah, righty, I'm going to let this roll for one second and save my dog from eating something sharp. One sec. <laughs> and we're back. Looks like finance, no surprise there, is at the top of the key, followed by sales, marketing, and scale. They've been surviving, so, listen. I'm yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, well, so hopefully we're going to be posting some more of those in the next couple of months and we'll follow up with what events we have on the horizon. But Don, let's jump into some Q&A from the audience. Um, let's see. You want to take them or I see so many. I dude. got, yeah. I'll, I'll, and there's I'll so many in the chat too and I can't go to the chat. If you guys, you guys put your question in the chat, put it over in Q&A because I know we're not going to be able to go to both. Yep. And our, and our awesome production team has been <laughs> also helping drive to there. Awesome. Thank so you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just roll off these. We'll have a conversation around them. So if you're relaunching a crowdfunding campaign to raise additional funds, what's the best way to successfully relaunch? Well, we're launching off, off that previous investor community, you know, like that's what I did. It's like, Hey, you guys all invested, make me a video. Well, what I did is did a roadshow and I went around to six cities and met my investors in person. This is before COVID. So this is 2019. I went around, met them in person and got bought some, you know, bought them food and drinks and we talked and, you know, we got to connect and they got to feel that this is a real person I'm invested in. They're touchable. You know, we can, they're not running off of my money. This is real. And then after that, I really, I really used them to help me push the next one forward. They became evangelists. They were happy to do, you know, a testimonial while they invested. They were happy to spread the word, reshare. They would post things. I would send them out on my emails and say, if you're a proud popcom investor, post this on your social. Hundreds of people posted a proud popcom investor. So again, community is really what it's about. It takes a certain personality and personality type to be able to do this at this scale. It's not for everybody. It just it's a lot. You know, someone said, "How do you have your energy?" I don't know, but this is what has been <laughs> able allow me to get where I'm at today. It takes a lot of energy for sure. You have the true entrepreneurial spirit, Don. Um, another question here. So you talked about testing the waters. Um, so they're asking, did you test it in LinkedIn? Did you reach out to VCs on LinkedIn? How'd you, uh, how'd you approach? Oh, okay. It's a avenues? technical thing. It's called a test the waters campaign. And it's actually launched by the crowdfunding platform. So they will put your campaign up there, but they, you won't be able to take money. You can just, people can make reservations. So they can say, they can click a button and say a pledge. You know, back in the day, you make a pledge. I pledge a hundred dollars. If you happen to crowdfund, I will invest in it, but they're not sending you any money, but it's really a way to test to see if they will. 
And I will say from Test the Waters campaigns, you're going to convert about 50% of those people to actually putting the money there, but at least they're getting the momentum and you're getting the engagement. Love that. Um, and somebody asked uh, a little bit of insights on just like getting start with the cap table. How that would be getting a lawyer. Yep. That's, <laughs> that's the only way. There's You don't need to do that. Um, in the very beginning of my first business, I was the LLC. It was me and one other person. I put in 50%. He put in 50%. The cap table is 50-50. That's it, us. That is, the cap table is a capitalization table with a breakdown of everybody that owns shares in your company, the money they put in and the, and the shares that they have. It's very easy when it's a couple of you guys. You, it's a spreadsheet. But then when you start really getting into actually taking institutional capital and taking capital from outside people, a lawyer or a service that does cap table management can do that because again, it's a legal document. They're no longer uh, stock certificates. So your cap table is the way that people prove ownership. And it's a very, very serious thing not to be taken lightly. Totally. Um, let's see, we have another question here and you've done a ton of diligence on all these platforms. So in your perspective, what's the difference between equity versus reward crowdfunding? And why did you choose equity? Good question. So I think that for me, I chose equity because we're not, we were not generating revenue at the, at the time. Someone mentioned, can you crowdfund for MVP? Yes, you can. You can crowdfund with no product. You can use this as your friends and family round. So that means that you you if you're selling equity before you have a product, you can't give a reward because you don't have revenue. Those kind of models work great for people that are actually generating sales, have money. This is their scaling round. And then they can give customers, um, investors, things like dividends. We don't give out dividends either because we need to reinvest all of our profits right back into the company. So it depends. I have a very, very capital intensive business. We build hardware, we have patents, we build software. Some businesses, I mean, you can have it a lot easier than me. I, I I don't envy, you know, myself. So I'm saying like you, if you don't have a business that's very, very capital intensive and you have a shorter path to profitability, you have more options like revenue shares, like rewards. Me, I did not have the option because we were three years away from product and market. My first crowdfunding campaign, close 2019, first product launched December, 2021. So I would have been in some hot water promising money that we weren't able to deliver. Yeah. All great advice. All right. Another question here. How early would you say is too early to do equity crowdfunding? I don't think it's ever too early. Um, if you have your due diligence, if you have a company that's legally incorporated in your state, if you have all the contracts and agreements, employment agreement with yourself, if you have all of your you know, business plans, your business model, how you're going to make money, revenue model, it's not too early. This can be your friends and family round. My friends and family round actually came from friends and family. I raised $200,000 from friends and family. I realized everyone does not have that network. This is what crowdfunding can be for you. And it's not as much required if it's yours called a pre-seed pre-revenue, pre-seed. They know you don't have any money. It's called pre-seed for a reason. They know you don't, you haven't made any money yet. So th those investors will realize that, but you definitely need to have your materials very clear to explain to them how you're going to make money and return their money. That's always the plan. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost to run a crowdfunding campaign? And I guess it's all dependable on yeah. how much budget you have. Well, like, it's, up front, you need probably like 2,500 and now to 5,000. That'll likely be for like your, your financial statements because you cannot, even though you might have your own bookkeeper and CPA, your financial review has to be done by outside person. So you have to hire somebody else because they have to double check their work for accuracy. So that's that. Then you have to pay bad actor fees. Um, so everyone on your team has to get like a background check um, through the SEC to pay Edgar fees. So I would think about 5,000 to start. There's platform fees, but now what I've seen is all of the platforms will defer their fees, but it's generally five to ten thousand dollar platform fees that you will pay out of your um out of your disbursement. So after towards when you, you know, at the end of the campaign, you pay the fees. They also have escrow fees. They also have um fees for processing credit cards, fees for processing ACH, fees for everything. And I did talk about this as well on um one of my blogs. So you have to factor that in. The way that I was able to justify it slightly in my mind was that 
from raising my institutional round, I spent a lot of money on traditional attorneys doing documents and reviewing terms of lawyers. I also flew to San Francisco and New York and all over the country raising money. And so that adds up. So it's like, you're going to pay regardless. It's, it's, it's definitely a money making scheme, all the fundraising, unless you're just raising from like people, you know, and check to check, but anytime people are involved, you're going to be paying fees. Love that. Um, and of course, you got to pay to play. All right. Oh, we've got so many questions. Thank you all. We're going to try to do like some lightning round stuff. So how does your equity dilute through different rounds in uh, crowdfunding versus venture capital? Or same is it format. It yep. works the same way. Dilution is only based on shares issued and the price per share. And that's same no matter what. Love it. Um, great questions, y'all. Um, when do, would you suggest a pre-purchase campaign on your website versus using a platform? Uh, so I'm guessing this is like a waitlist question. Yeah, that's out of my, because I don't do prepaid pre-sales, but that would be like a Kickstarter type of thing. It would not be something you do on a start engine or a WeFunder. It's not a place to pre-sell. So again, in the beginning of this, I said there's two types. There's equity crowdfunding and then there's products and pre-sales. That's kind of out of my wheelhouse for products and pre-sales. I just really don't know because you have to then deliver that product. And I've seen instances where people raise money for a product and it took years for them to build it because they thought they could build it faster and it didn't happen and people were very angry. So I, I just don't recommend that unless you know for sure the product delivery date. Yep. Um, what length of time would you suggest your campaign should stay open? Well, three is the default, three months. And I really would like, that's ideal to open and close it in three months. When you're coming along like the 45 day threshold, you'll kind of see the tempo and they give you an option if you want to try to extend it for a small fee. It just depends on what's going on. You know, it's different. When it was um one campaign took me like a month, one campaign took me 6 months. It's about what's going on in the world. You know, it's about what's what where people's eyeballs are at. What's what's happening. You know, I went I raised almost 4 million dollars through COVID and all of the George Floyd and all of the things happening. So it was a little bit harder because of a lot of distractions and a lot of things happening in the world that took people's eyes away from crowdfunding and raising money. You know, it just wasn't ideal yeah um and yeah the world's a crazy place uh let's see another question uh that i like um so <laughs> are there like. <laughs> no well no i think this is valuable for whoever asked it because yeah. um yeah so are someone's asking are there companies who can walk you through setting up a crowdfunding campaign and would you, know, you use them i've never heard of them i'm sure there's some but why, when you can just read my blog for free and I've given all the information out a thousand times, like literally it's not that hard. It's just a formula and I, it's on my blog. But if you just need like someone to do actual work, um, maybe you could work with them. I haven't, I haven't seen it. I've used to do coaching, but now I just, I don't have the bandwidth, which is why I did my blog and I put out a lot of free resources. I really strongly believe if you read this up, I put out there, you'll be fine. Love it. Um, how do you determine how much equity you want to put on the put on the the round? It's a strategy you need to work with with your attorney and your long term fundraising strategy and where you want to end up. So you raise money based on the strategy of how much you need to raise over time, how much you need to release and now and how they're going to be diluted. So fundraising on this level is there. It does come down to strategy where you how much as a founder do you actually really want to give up at the end of the day and then kind of work backwards from there. Love it. Ooh, somebody says they want to invest in Popcom. We encourage it. Hey, we love to see it. Do. Open right now. The round is open for the less than 48 hours. So please do minimum $100. Love it. Um, and then somebody's saying, it seems like you need to be really educated in crowdfunding to do it successfully. Is this true? No, because I didn't know anything. I, I was the first one to do it. And I just like figured it out on the way through. Not the first one to crowdfund. The first one to raise a million, which like really hit the, the goal. The first one to ever reach the max. And I think it's like, I've done it all these times. So now you can just follow the model. Everyone that's kind of followed the model that I keep on sharing, they have success. It, you don't, if you just follow the model, look at myself, look at Isaac, Isaac Hayes, look at a uh, curl mix, look at Angela Benton with Streamlytics, look at Pierre with, um, oh my God, I forgot his name, his, his company name, but like people are doing this exact thing and it's working. Love it. Um, have you tried cold email outreach and then does it work? For investing? Uh, no, for putting the campaign out. 
no i don't i don't i don't i don't have the bandwidth you know can you imagine oh my goodness but we do yeah. our cold emails version would be like those facebook ads but mm. no, not, not um not i wouldn't recommend it i wouldn't recommend it people it people think it's spam too much yeah um ooh, this is an interesting question uh how do you manage your work life and i like the term work life integration not balance because balance makes you seem like you're trading something off for the other but uh right. how do you manage it all don i always say that people say balance and i always say there's no balance it's prioritizing things each day or each each hour of what is at what's the most important thing that you have to be focused on and so i prioritize I, i'm very very organized extremely my house, my, you know, everything about me is very, very organized, my phone, my schedule. So I, I plan things out and I feel very, um, I feel good. You know, I feel, even though I have all these things going on and so, so much, I definitely always pencil in time for myself and to give myself whatever I need for that day. And I always make time for, you know, my family. It may not be every day, but prioritizing because I don't do my work every day. Some days my work is priority. Some days my family's priority. Some days I'm the priority. But it's just a matter of picking what is the most urgent thing to attend to and doing that. That's some great advice. Just generally in speaking. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see another one. Oh, well, I think you talked a little bit about this with the amount of shares, but somebody's asking about uh, how do you determine your valuation? Again, there's no calculation. My valuation was based on the market, same way stocks on the stock market are impacted. Startup valuations are definitely impacted by the market. I didn't even realize that till this year because I've never been so greatly impacted until 2022. Literally in February, the whole thing shifted. I was out raising a VC run. I had a lead investor for my Series A and that whole thing shifted. And my valuation was going to be $50 million and now it's 26. So what does that tell you? It's all really like what they say, which I don't always align with this, but this is what they say. They say your valuation is whatever someone's willing to pay for it. That's why when I say stuff like, why in the heck did Clubhouse get that valuation? They said, well, Andreessen paid it. So th that's the startup world. Me, as a business person, I believe your valuation should be based on a multiple of your sales, your pipeline, and you know what you your IP. And that way it can be a clean valuation. And then you can give a real return because you're, you're pricing your business at a way, at a price that it can actually be acquired by someone and not pricing it to just keep raising and raising and raising to get in the business of raising money and not making money. I think you need to think about that because you might get to a valuation so high that you can never sell your company for that. And then what are you doing this for? Yeah. Um, another question here around, and we're almost at time, Don, but this has been all solid gold. Um, let's see. Any advice for solo entrepreneurs trying to crowdfund? Do crowdfunding campaigns do poorly if they people only see that you're a solo entrepreneur? I'm a solo entrepreneur. Uh, hey, there you go, Terry. There's your answer. There you go, Terry. I mean, you know, no, because um, they just have to have confidence, you know, and it's up to you. You you create the tone, you set the tone, you come out to the table with confidence, that confidence is infectious, they will believe you. If you come out feeling like, I don't know, I mean, I'm crowdfunding, I never did this, I'm by myself, they're gonna be like, I don't know about this. You know, <laughs> so you you just come out being confident. You can do this as a solo founder. I've been a solo founder most of my life, I only had one co-founder. Love it. Oh, well, we're almost at time and I wanna give another moment just to wrap everything with a bow that we've been talking about today. So. In a nutshell, what's your advice for a community and entrepreneurs who are thinking about crowdfunding, you know, in a, uh, in a nutshell? In a nutshell, have your due diligence in, in place for sure. Understand how you're going to return investors money. So have your financial model in place, because once you get all this money, you're going to put it out and it got to come back. So your financial model is really, really key. You can communicate how you're going to, to make money, how you're going to grow. Think about the next money coming in before you take the first money. So if, you, you, if you're if you going to raise crowdfunding, like, let me give you a quick example before I go. I'll, I'll co meet with entrepreneurs and coach them and they'll say, I need to raise money. I'll raise a million dollars. Don't throw out an arbitrary number of what sounds cool to raise. Actually raise what you need to give yourself X amount of runway money in the bank without profitability is runway. How many months can you go if you don't bring in any more dollars for you before you're out of money? You want to have your runway as long as possible. And then, of course, your revenue can add to that. So you want to raise money. They generally say raise money for 12 to 18 months of runway. That might not be a million dollars to you. And you have to be realistic because if you're going to tell an investor, I just need a million because that's the number million. It is not going to make sense. So get your numbers in order and then say, okay, you raised maybe 250 now. 
million next time. This is the place where you plan out where do you, how many uh, shares you give up, how much equity. In the beginning, you know, if you say, listen, at the end of this, I don't want to exit my company with less than 20%. All of your behavior that you do has to have to actually model that to the point where you're not going to let yourself dilute to 20%. That's reflected in your, what you raise, that's your valuation when you raise. So all those things, this comes to a strategy. And I recommend everyone getting with a really good securities attorney or someone early as possible because you're going, if you don't pay now, you're going to pay later for the mistakes. I've paid more mistakes trying to avoid not paying the price for something. I've paid more that. in the mistake. Yeah, pay a little now to save pain later. Well, what a way to end it. Don, it's been so great to have this conversation with you. I really appreciate you sharing your time and expertise. For those of you who want to check out more from Don, she's got that blog. We're going to follow up with her website. If you want to see the, an example of what I think is a perfect crowdfunding campaign, check out Don's um, Popcom raise that's live right now. Artisan.com. Yep. yep. And if you want to get in, Popcom. Yep. And you got the money. Uh, we encourage you to invest because of course, uh, Don, we believe in you. So thank you so much, thank Don, you. for sharing your advice and expertise today. And for those of you online, hopefully this is valuable and we look forward to seeing you all online soon. Thanks again, Bye Don. Guys. Thank you.